Good evening and welcome to Hard Fire. I am your host, Joseph Dobrian, here with you for another half hour of discussion of politics and current events from a libertarian perspective. My guest this evening is Fred Benenson, the president of Free Culture at NYU, which is a uh, student club at New York University that uh, is part of an international movement for copyright reform and free culture advocacy. Uh, so, Mr. Benenson, I'm going to start just by asking you to define your terms, which is what we libertarians always ask people to do. Um, what is free culture and why are you for it? Uh, that's a great question. And I think it's, it's a pretty general term. Uh, first, first kind of notable use of it for me was uh, a book by a, a law professor named Lawrence Lessig. He wrote a book called Free Culture. And it's kind of a call to arms about how copyright law and uh, the law in general and technology can be used to prevent uh, creative uses of culture and remixing and a read-write culture. Um, since then, there's been uh, a student movement, which I'm a part of, uh, but then there's also the kind of general free culture movement. Um, the, there, there's been an attempt to uh, define what free culture actually is, and it's if you actually go to the website uh, freedomdefined.org, you can uh, find a definition of free cultural works. Okay. Now, um, let me ask you about um, the need for copyright reform. A lot of people would say that uh, we've got to have copyright laws to protect intellectual property. Uh, do you agree with that, or do you believe that uh, copyright laws should be gotten rid of entirely? Well, I think my, my favorite way of answering that question is to think about the original intent of copyright as written into the U.S. Constitution. Um, the Constitution says, um, I'm paraphrasing, but essentially we should have things like copyright and laws to protect, uh, not to protect artists and creators, but to promote the progress of science and arts. So most people just see that as giving incentives to creators. Um, the idea that if we do that and we give them limited monopoly rights over the work that they create, that's going to kind of advanced uh, or encourage people to make more uh, copyrighted work and, and kind of um, help grow the creative work of, of America, which is true. But the other half of the equation is that copyright was also meant to enlarge the public domain, a set of works, a, a body of works that anybody can draw from without attribution, without royalty payments, without feeling the need to hire a lawyer. The public domain is kind of the open pool of works that anybody can use. Okay, now let me ask you about that because I am a uh, journalist by trade. I publish a great deal, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm always flattered when another journalist or mm -hmm. some other writer cites my work and yeah. attributes it to mm -hmm. me. But if somebody were to plagiarize my work, right. I'd be ticked off. So, so there's a big difference between copyright reform and advoca advocating for pr uh, plagiarism, which is not something we're interested in. Uh, the, the public domain, uh, works enter the public domain, originally they were supposed to enter 14 years after their creation. So that means you had a 14 year right to claim that it was yours, and then after that you had the choice to renew, and so on. Now it's 70 years after your death. So um, people have to pay copyright for access to your work, but the interesting part and the thing that a lot of people don't understand is that there is no law about plagiarism. In Europe there is, there's something called moral rights, but in America there's no such thing as uh, suing somebody for misattributing something. They, you, you, you may sue them for copyright infringement if somebody republishes your entire article. They're violating your copyright, but they're, by claiming it as theirs, they're not actually committing any crime. So um, the interesting twist well, is they'll, that... Well, they'll usually be fired out of their jobs if right, they I mean, that. Uh, yeah, in, in a kind of a, a social value way, they definitely are uh, violating your interests. So um, in a way, we... We think that people should be attributed. The idea of attribution is incredibly important. And it's actually what a lot, a lot of the free culture movement depends on, is that people will give out their work for free on the condition that they're attributed. And that's what's called a permissive license. Okay, now there is a point on which I agree with you mm -hmm. because um, I recently wrote a uh, work of fiction which um, depends a great deal on song lyrics. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are a lot of song lyrics yeah. 
transcribed in the uh, book, and of course, if I um, want to actually publish that, I'm going to have to pay royalties right. to the songwriter and or to whoever holds the copyright. Right. Which, so is that the kind of thing that you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, that's precisely it, which from our perspective, it actually does the opposite of incentivizing you to create a work. It prevents you from creating a work. You're actually worried about this disseminating your work now for fear of a lawsuit because you happen to be referencing lyrics from a song. Now, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, the original idea was that we're supposed to give you an incentive to create. And now we have the kind of perverse reality of copyright providing a disincentive for you to create. And so that's, that's precisely what free culture is about, is that um, these laws that were originally created and maintained to encourage people creating works are now being used in exactly the opposite fashion. And I think that's a great example. OK. On the other hand, people are going to say, well, copyright is property. It's mm -hmm. something that you can monetize. Right. Um, and if, for example, I believe Paul McCartney owns the rights to a great, great many mm -hmm. songs that were not his even, right. um, such as On Wisconsin and so on like that. Mm -hmm. And so he presumably could collect a royalty mm -hmm. anytime any of these songs are used. Now, I could say, look, whether we like it or not, Paul McCartney paid good money for those mm -hmm. song rights, and he has the right to collect every time they're used. Now, what's your response to that? So the, the, there are kind of uh, two points here. One is that um, copyright's a little different from uh, the, well, the question of distribution and sh sharing things online is, is kind of something that we're really interested in. The question of uh, kind of reusing rights and paying royalties and getting commercial rights to put a song in a music video or, or play it at a concert or a restaurant is kind of a different set of rights. And the copyright refers to kind of a grand um, set of rights, which can be anything from distribution to publishing to public performance, and it's, it's pretty hard to entail them all. The second point is, is that the metaphor of property, in my opinion, uh, is kind of outdated at this point. If you look at how thing, things work online, uh, they work in a way in such that it's almost the opposite of property. When you send me a file, you're not actually losing it out of your control. I mean, from a libertarian's perspective, it's incredibly important that you own and can control the objects that are in your possession. And that's almost your definition of property. I'm sure you actually probably have a better one. Um, but the idea that when you send me something over the internet, you're not actually losing the possession of your original one. You're only doing it in an abstract way, the idea that um, since I'm getting a copy from you, I might not buy a copy or, or um, I might not use it in a particular way that you want it. Um, but it's very important to understand that the, end, the, the era of scarcity is over, for, in a way, for cultural products. And it doesn't make sense to use this metaphor of property anymore. So I, I think that the idea of intellectual property is, is, is coming under a lot of heat because of the way media flows through the internet. Well, it's true that uh, you can go onto your computer and download a great many music videos uh, for for free. Yeah. Um, which um, conceivably the person who put together in the first place would like to be collecting royalties right. for, but so they're not going to. It then becomes a question of royalties and how do you, how do you compensate the person properly for the use that you're having it? Because they're not actually losing access to the original work. I mean, it's it's very different from somebody giving you a car. For example, right. so 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 then it becomes a question of royalties, and and this is kind of an interesting um, kind of future business model that a lot of people in the free culture world like to promote the idea of a um, of a monthly subscription rate to download as much music as you want would be one solution, and then that gets distributed in the same kind of like way that um, publicity, uh, I'm sorry, um, radio licenses. Okay, but would that be enforceable? I mean, right yeah. now, it's uh, it's pretty darn easy to mm -hmm. download uh, music videos and so on like that without having to pay for it. Would that come to an end? Well, in Canada, actually, yesterday, mm -hmm. I heard that they're actually, the, the Canadian music industry, uh, a number of labels are calling for what's called collective licensing. It's the term for what I uh, was just discussing, where the idea of adding a levy on top of your internet connection um, so that that then accumulates and, and then it's distributed in the same way that um, uh, kind of royalties are distributed now. The, the question of enforceability is an interesting one and, and um, it kind of comes down to how, how much of a wild, wild west is the internet? Is it possible to track down people who wouldn't be paying this uh, collective licensing fee and, and, and penalize them? I think it might be. I mean, it's, 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 a, um, it's a difficult question. The technology is not there. The, the, um, kind of uh, legal structure is not quite there yet, but I think it, I think we owe a lot to this whole argument if we start exploring it.
Mm -hmm. Well, I think the technology does exist to uh, monitor just about everybody's That's definitely internet true. use. Yeah and uh, conceivably mm -hmm. to prosecute them if they are misusing it. So in a, in a, in a scary way, you're, you're probably right. I mean, it, the telecom industry is uh, under a lawsuit right now about this, and they're, and they're seeking uh, retroactive immunity because they've violated a, a significant portion of the uh, Americans' privacy by reading their email without a, without a warrant. Um, and so it demonstrates that there is potential uh, to, to monitor Internet access on a, on a scale that um, isn't commercially available yet or, or commercially known. So in a scary way, it's, it's almost certainly possible. Okay. Uh, let me ask you about the, um, the book publishing industry. Mm -hmm. um, I realize that a lot of people say that it's a dying industry, um, actual print well, See, publishing. I disagree, but. Continue. Okay, but, yeah. well, good, then we yeah. can talk about this. Um, I remember reading books, I mean, articles by mm -hmm. Charles Dickens, to name mm -hmm. one, and Oscar Wilde, to name another, both of whom complained that when they came to America, mm -hmm. they found people selling their books, right. not paying them any royalties. It was the original kind of use and of the term private piracy in this context. Yeah, yeah, is that, would you advocate that sort of thing? Well, the, the history of piracy in America is fantastically interesting. Charles Dickens actually did a tour um, trying to encourage people to buy his books and was infuriated that people were pirating it mm -hmm. overseas. And, and um, Oscar Wilde's estate kind of has that same perspective now. They actually just lost a pretty significant lawsuit over um, the rights to use, um, uh, the rights for academics to use uh, significant portions of Oscar Wilde's daughter, I believe, uh, her journals. Um, wanted he had two sons, no daughters. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, his son, um, maybe? I'm, 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 I think you may be confused because he had a son named Vivian. Yeah, that might be it then. Anyway, uh, there was a lawsuit which Lessig, the lawyer who wrote the Free Culture book, uh, worked hard on and, and won for uh, the ability uh, for academics to access the, those journals. And um, I'm forgetting um, uh, which ones, whose they actually were, but it, it was incredibly important for, oh, you know what, it's Joyce and Scholars. Um, not uh, not Oscar Wilde, but anyway, to to go back to um, well, that's too bad because Wilde was a much better writer than <laughs> Joyce, in my opinion. <laughs> oh man, that's that's embarrassing. But anyway, um, back to the uh, the point about uh, book publishing. Um, the publishing industry, I think, probably has the best chance of all the other entertainment, cultural industries right now. Music, the music industry was was. Uh, uh, significantly hurt by um, the fact that the product you were able to get online was equivalent to the one that you were buying in the store, except for some liner notes, physical copy of the object. What you wanted from music from the store was what you got from music over the internet for free. So they had a really hard time competing with that, and now they're kind of forcing to comp uh, having to compete with that in a very real way. The video industry is a little bit better. People like having copies of DVDs, or they like going to the movie theater. There's a kind of a there's a step up in how difficult it is to get the same experience off the internet for free. Right. That's that's changing, but the video industry is doing a little bit better than the music industry in that respect. In the same way, I think the book industry is doing better than all of them because, as my girlfriend likes to say, that librarians um, she she used to work at a library, and and the one thing librarians care about in terms of this debate is uh, the three Bs: uh, bed bath and beach and the idea that you can enjoy a book in all those contexts is still going to be relegated to the kind of hardcover or hard copy version of it and um, it's very it's 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 coming around but it's not quite to the point where you can get a digital copy from a friend and enjoy it in the same way that you can enjoy a physical book so in that way I think the publishing industry is going to be okay for a long time selling hard copies of books on that particular day. It's not a great system, but it's better than the music system, and I think they'll, you know, aren't that's there, just my opinion. Aren't there new products out now mm -hmm. that um, will allow you to read a book on a uh, small handheld computer, wherever you may be? Yeah, the, there, there are a couple. Sony's eBook was the first one, and now there's the Amazon Kindle. And these are pretty good. I've, I've seen them, and they're actually they're compelling devices to read, and they're they, they work well, and I have friends who rave about them, I, and who got them for Christmas, and have read four books by now on them, and uh, really enjoy the, the idea of having your entire library in one handheld thing. Um, we'll see what happens when we get to that point where more people have access to those or own those and uh, can download their own copies. What's really cool, though, is that there's a, there are a couple great websites out there that index public domain works, so works that were made previous to 1923 are in the public domain and can be used um, mm -hmm. Uh, free of charge, and so you can put whatever you want on there. So Oliver Twist, I'm not sure if uh, 
Oscar Wilde would, would fall under there, but Oliver Twist certainly Well, he's would. certainly been dead um, for more than 70 years. Yeah, um, mm. but it depends on when the work was created. And that's why I think you can you can buy his complete works at okay. Barnes & Noble for $6.95. Yeah, that's precisely like it. That. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not as much of a wild buff, um, but yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And well, Dickens' work is almost equally cheap, I right. would say. Uh, ditto Mark Twain, mm -hmm. um, other so, great authors from that era. All of these works are available for free online, and you can download them in pretty much any format you want uh, without having to pay any copyright or worry about that. So, Okay. Uh, does your organization oppose um, piracy, such as um, those authors used to complain of in the old days? Well, that kind of wholesale commercial piracy where somebody downloads a copy and, and records it to a DVD or something and starts selling it on the corner, um, I think we do oppose. I think that is a, that's kind of a real commercial harm that we're causing the original creators. And um, Then there's the question of file sharing, where it's a non-commercial transfer between one person. Um, in kind of previous decades, people used to just think nothing of this. If you had the capability to do it, you'd just do it. Nobody really thought about copyright. It was kind of a... Um, it was kind of outside the zone of copyright, and this is actually how copyright worked for a long time. Is that day to day, um, people's you know efforts and, and interactions didn't really intersect with copyright. But now they do. If you want, if I want to give you a copy of the CD, in some way, um, we have to be cognizant that there's a there's a you know copyright concern there. So um, it's a difficult question. The idea of um, of you know piracy online that's non-commercial and, and distributing it and, and how it works. I, I can say I, I do support and I, and I actively encourage artists to take advantage of that. That kind of scale and that audience is unprecedented. And I think a lot of musicians and um, filmmakers are starting to realize that it's a great opportunity. Um, so, you know, there's, there are distinct parties, uh, particularly in Sweden, who believe that a copyright should just be abolished outright and that there's no reason to talk about uh, well, reform. Well, uh, you know, in Sweden, they don't believe in personal property at all. Right, right. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if that's true, but I know they definitely don't, I know they're definitely a segment uh, of the population who, who actively doesn't believe in copyright and doesn't believe it should exist. I think that's a kind of extreme version of the, of the free culture argument taken to a, an extreme, and I'm not sure if I'm personally comfortable with it because it, 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 desta it, will des it has the potential to destabilize a creative industry so that everyone kind of has to start from scratch again. And that's really invigorating for some people and really exciting for some people, but in a way it, it, it ignores a lot of the achievements and, and work that people have done in, in, in an industry that was almost functional, in industries that were almost functional for a long time. Okay. Now has your organization or has any other organization done a study on um, what the practical effect would be? Uh, is going to be on the music industry, on the film industry, and the book publishing industry. Well, I, you know, it's uh, there's there talk already that uh, uh, the the mega record stores such as Virgin and such are going to be in terrible trouble before too long. Well, the, you know, there's a um, there's there were a lot of studies about this. People wanted to say file sharing actually encourages CD purchases. File sharing doesn't encourage CD purchases. You know, um, who are the people that are file sharing? And that and that demographic has changed con like constantly since it since the beginning of Napster. The people who cared a lot about Napster were music fans, and they would just be the people who would consume music no matter what in whatever form they could get their hands on. And they kind of created a, a library for for um, for others to use. Um, and then it's kind of shifted. It's become general population. It's really excuse me. It's really popular in most in most demographics. You talk to any young person, and they've heard of file sharing, and they and they care about it, and they use it. In a, in a um, I guarantee it in, in some in some capacity. Um, so the question of whether or not that demographic still buys music is up for debate. But I think the way it starts out, and some of the most avid and enthusiastic file sharers and the people who who, who trade music online are huge music consumers and go to live shows, buy band CDs, um, that kind of thing. So does that kind of answer your question? I think. Um, yeah, I just wondered if there had been any. Um, measurement in, in actual dollars of right. the effect of this new technology on... I guess what I wanted to say was that it's, it's pretty obvious at this point that the record industry can't compete with free distribution online. And it's, and it's very hard to make people realize that buying the CD product is, just, is, is, is better than getting a free copy off a file sharing network or a free copy from a friend. Um, it's, it's very hard to compete with free in that way. And so um, 
I don't know the specific numbers, but I know the record industry is not doing as well as they most most or they once did. Uh, a lot of people consider the high water mark to be around 2002, 2003 of when CDs were getting really the most popular they've ever been, and they were making the most money they ever ever made. But mm -hmm. since then, it's been a pretty gradual decline. There was a good article in Wired which has all the numbers and graphs and stuff. And um, digital music is becoming more popular. Purchasing it from sites like iTunes or my favorite Amazon uh, MP3 is is now becoming a more popular option. But it's by no means making up for the kind of lost um, capital that, that has gone away and for whatever reason. Okay. Well, I think it's uh, obvious to a lot of us that um, current copyright laws uh, are more or less obsolete at this point mm -hmm. simply because technology has outrun it. Mm -hmm. uh, technology has, has got, gone so far ahead of the law and um, this, um, all this material can be easily disseminated mm -hmm. for free or for a lot less money right. by people who might not be authorized to do so. Mm -hmm. So do you think that um, it's feasible that copyright laws could be reformed so that, yeah. so as to make provision for current conditions? Well, that's that's really the the, the debate, right, is, is how much reform can we put into the copyright system? And there's some people that just, again, say we should abolish it. It's, it's, it was a broken system. It was a broken metaphor to begin with. Um, you know, property is okay, but this intellectual property is really hard to understand. I'm not sure I'm of that camp, um, but I'm also not sure reform is the most reasonable way of doing it, going through the kind of democratic political system because the kind of um, the, 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 the problems are so systematic for, or so systemic I should say um, that it's it's very difficult to begin to know where to start and and there are some recent laws that have been passed that could be rolled back only 10 years and we'd be at a kind of more reasonable place um, I think to start um, copyright terms shouldn't last as long as they do. Uh, Seventy years after the author's death is an inordinate amount of time and it's almost crazy to think that it's working as an incentive for authors because after the author dies, 70 more years of that protection isn't going to make him make any more art, right? I mean, uh, it may encourage uh, his family to, to spend them the, the royalties uh, on, on, on things that they would like or his estate, um, but it doesn't mean that um, the author is going to be creating anything new and there's going to be anything added to society. So I think that's the best place to start, from my opinion, is, is to start rolling, rolling back the kind of length of copyright granted. But that's a really tricky problem because um, if suddenly tomorrow everyone's told that they only get 14 years of copyright protection and then they can renew if they choose to after another 14 years, um, that's going to be very controversial for anybody who wants to be the next you know, in sync or or, Indeed so. or or anything like that. So it's very hard to r kind of ratchet back what's been done to the copyright laws. Uh -huh. So I'm a big advocate for kind of alternative ways of reforming the system. Uh, and what would some of those be? Organization I work for uh, is uh, called Creative Commons, and we offer um, licenses that mimic um, the kind of freedoms we'd like to have for cultural works. So or not mimic, instill. Um, they. Um, they mimic the laws that we would like to reform copyright with or, or the ways in which we'd like to reform copyright law. Um, the basic idea is that there's the public domain, which is no rights reserved. There's nothing the author can do to, to his work um, if it's in the public domain. Um, but that wouldn't matter because you'd be dead. But <laughs> supposing you were alive in the public domain, you couldn't control your work. But then there's all rights reserved copyright. Um, and that's the idea of you retaining every possible use you could under the law. Um, so that if you want to excerpt a, a couple lyrics for your book, um, you would certainly have to hire a lawyer and we'd have to negotiate some kind of royalty payment. So Creative Commons is the middle ground mm -hmm. between that, a gray area to provide artists who want to release their work online um, or want to give it to friends, they can say, you're free to use this as long as you give me attribution. Or you're free to use this as long as you give me attribution and, non and you use it non-commercially. Mm -hmm. So there's kind of a whole array of licenses that you can stitch together and then apply to your work and then mm -hmm. use it. And then when other people come across it, you'll have kind of previously given permission for those uses. Okay, and now uh, just for the uh, edification of yeah. other authors who might want to uh, lift some song lyrics, uh, yeah. what, for example, would I have to expect to pay Paul McCartney if I wanted to use the lyrics on Wisconsin? So I, I'm, I'm not a lawyer and I, I don't know enough about how royalties work to know if you could use what's called compulsory licensing. For, for those lyrics or if you would have to strike a specific deal. When it's, called, when it's considered a public performance, you're, um, 
you're performing a song in public, you're on mm -hmm. stage singing it. There's something called a compulsory, compulsory license, which the artist has to grant you. Mm -hmm. So that um, there's an established rate for that, and that's that's agreed upon by Congress. And okay, the, but and if I'm writing an article, for example, right. and if I if I want to quote, say, mm -hmm. the first verse of yesterday, right. is that something? Would that be fair use, or would that be something? Well, I'm that have to you know, for? I knew we were going to end up on the question of fair use, and in a way, fair use is is there and exists in, as an abstract reality in a way, in a kind of a uh, way for you to um, step your foot into these waters, but it's not, um, in my opinion, a realistic way to do this. Because if, if somebody finds that and they don't like it, they sue you, and then fair use is the defense you use when they sue you. So, so fair, use, fair is use is not very well defined, is it? It's, 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 it's a gray area, and it's purposely a gray area. There, there are four general factors, but there are no hard lines in fair use. So it's really challenging to know from, from your perspective, what you can do and how much you can excerpt. Um, I don't know the specific laws with quoting song lyrics. Um, you know, they, they might gouge you. They could say it's $10,000 to use it in two sentences. I've, I've heard of these stories before where um, uh, a documentary is being made and um, a woman is walking on the street with her daughter and her cell phone rings and it's the Rocky theme song. Oh. And uh, it's just a couple <laughs> seconds of it, but by the time the film gets into post-production, they're clearing all the rights, they're realizing that this is a liability, oh they don't have the gosh. rights for the Rocky song. Yeah, it's a great movie, it's called Red Hot Ballroom. But you um, would think that you could argue that she's actually promoting Bill Conti's film score, and it's going to make people want to rush out there and buy the CD so that they can hear all yeah, that Yeah, or arguably music. It's, it's what's called de minimis, which is the kind of like the minimum amount, and it's, it's, it's so small it doesn't matter. But it turns out that there are some big court cases about whether or not sampling is allowed in, in, um, in other songs specifically, but it, people understand it as applying to films as well. And the court ruled that when you sample, you license. So it doesn't matter how small the sample is or how short it is or how indecipherable it is, you still must pay for a license. So uh. it ended up being like, some inordinate amount of money for this woman to have to yeah. raise. Just well, so I'm, I am uh, sorely tempted to wrap up this show by whistling the uh, Rocky theme song, but hey. I'm not going to do yeah. that. I'm too chicken. <laughs> I don't want to get sued. But we do have to wrap up now. Right. So thank you very no much, Fred Benenson, president yeah. of Free Culture at NYU. And uh, thank you all for tuning in. And we will see you on the next edition of Hard Fire. Hard Fire is funded in part by the Libertarian Party of New York, www.ny.lp.org. Catering for the cast and crew of Hard Fire is generously provided by Da Vincenzo Restaurant, 256 Prospect Park West, Brooklyn, New York, 11215, 718-369-3590, www.davincenzorestaurant.com.